Let's start painting, shall we? The 10 point test from 1 John. Number one from 1 John 1 7. If we walk in the light, please notice we're going to see that if word a lot. If this, then that. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, here it is. Then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Saved, then you like fellowship. What is that exactly? Does it mean having some people over from church on a Sunday afternoon to watch a football game? Well, that's fine if you want to do that, but that's not fellowship. Fellowship is having Jesus Christ in the center of our conversation and our thoughts because we are in him and he is the chief priority of everybody in the room. And we enjoy spending time with fellow believers more than we do with the pagans. I'm not saying you don't have pagan friends, but you prefer to spend that quality time with fellow believers in fellowship. Do you bear that fruit? Here's number two from 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If this, then that. If we say we have no sin, you're not saved. Does that mean a person can simply yeah, you know, I've made some mistakes. There's been some boo-boos and hiccups in my life. Is that what John is after? Not even close. This is more like a Nineveh response. Ugh, I just want to throw dirt on my animals. I'm disgusted by my sin. I am like Paul. I want to do good, but I don't do it. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the very things that I do. Who will save me from this body of death? That's what John is after. May I ask you, what is your attitude toward your sin? Have you ever been appalled at yourself? Have you ever, dare I say, been disgusted with the things that you do and think? This is not to trash talk you. This is to help you see what John wants you to see. A true Christian, one who is walking in the truth, begins by recognizing I am more than just a bit messed up. I am totally depraved. Do you understand that about yourself? Test number three, 1 John 2, 3, by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, Question number one, do you know the commandments? And I'm not talking about the Big Ten. I'm talking about all of God's commandments, standards, and precepts. The true Christian does. Second question, are you striving to keep those laws? We're Protestants. We recognize that when we are born again, we are totally justified, declared from heaven, totally forgiven, past, present, future sins, as far as the East is from the West. We are justified. So we do not keep the commandments to gain God's approval. Thankfully, Jesus did that for us. Then, then, after we recognize my good works are not pleasing to God, I would rather climb to heaven on a rope of sand than try to work my way there because I absolutely can't. But Jesus could, and he did, and he credits all of that to me. Now I desire to keep his commandments. I want to be obedient. Do you hear the difference? Many are confused about this. They think that, okay, well, yeah, okay, God, God forgave me, but I got to keep doing stuff so that his face will shine upon me. It's not the way it works. You are totally forgiven. And because of that wonderful good news that serves as our motivation to be obedient, recognizing we can't please God any more than he is already pleased because he's totally pleased with Christ and we are in him. May I ask you, do you know the commandments? Are you keeping the commandments, understanding that you do not have to do things to earn salvation or to keep yourself in God's favor any more than a son who would approach a father and say, Dad, I'm going to mow the lawn. Can I still be your son? 
That's ridiculous, and so it is for the Christian. We are in Christ, we can go nowhere, and because of that, we want to get busy obeying the commandments. Test number four. First John 2, 15, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is the world? Is it this chair or this table? No, this is, it's a part of the world. But John is talking about the world system, the, the love of things as idols, or believing false systems, or following lies because it allows you to live licentiously. If we love that stuff, if we find more joy in the creation than we do in the Creator, we are not in Christ. How are you doing? I mean, leaving some marks, possibly. Remember the caveat. I don't want anybody to fall into despair. Remember the caveat. Maybe you, you, you haven't heard one of these four things. Then I would ask you, what's your response to that? Hmm? If it's like, you know, whatever, skinny guys, just being a little bit nitpicky, that's a big problem. But if you see one of these 10-point tests and recognize, oh, no, I haven't been doing that, that is the very good sign that you are indeed saved. We will continue with our 10-point test next on Wretched. Welcome back to Wretched. Prepare to experience what Dr. Steve Lawson's congregation experienced, a 10-point test from 1 John to potentially startle you out of your slumber, to wake you up to understanding when a man is born again, it's as radical as being born. 1 John, 10 points, 10 questions asking you, are you in the truth? Let's keep taking our test, shall we? This is number five. Anyone who denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. This would fall under the banner of Christology. Theology is important. Understanding who Jesus Christ is rightly is the difference between heaven and hell. The early church councils, they wrangled with this, and they made it very clear if we do not understand the Trinity rightly, if we do not understand the nature of Jesus Christ rightly, you have no place in the kingdom. Jesus himself labored over this point with the Pharisees in the marketplace, John 5, really through 11. If you don't believe in me, you don't have the Father. Theology is important. Do you understand that Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100% math, man? That's not bad arithmetic. That's good theology, and it's the difference between an eternity with God and damnation. Test number six. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He, Jesus, appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Do you long for the return of Jesus Christ? Do you hope that He is going to come back today to take his bride gathered together to the place that he has prepared for us. We live on this planet because God has left us here with work to do, which means, by the way, if you're not working for expanding the kingdom, then you're not being an obedient servant. If you happen to be older, that should be a word of comfort to you. If you are, say, in a nursing home, an assisted care facility, and you're thinking, I just want to be done. There's nothing for me to do here. Oh, yes, there is. He has assigned work for us to do. So don't stop working for the king until he calls you home. Until that time, we should be looking, longing, we should watch the reports on the news and not just be disgusted, but call out, come, Lord Jesus, come. That is a sign that you are in the faith. Test number seven. 
NO ONE WHO IS BORN OF GOD PRACTICES SIN BECAUSE HIS SEED ABIDES IN HIM AND HE CANNOT SIN BECAUSE HE IS BORN OF GOD. THIS IS NOT TO SUGGEST THAT CHRISTIANS DON'T SIN. WE DO SIN. BUT YOU SEE THIS LANGUAGE? PRACTICES SIN. THAT MEANS IF YOU DO THAT, YOU ARE WAKING UP IN THE MORNING, have I got plans to sin tonight? And you spend your day dreaming about what you're going to do at night. You're practicing sin day after day. You repeat the cycle. John, the apostle of love says you're of the devil. Please note, Christians fall into sin, but they do not dive and swim and practice sin. Test number eight. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. You say, wait, didn't you cover that with the fellowship with the brethren business? No, this is actually taking the idea of fellowship and putting it on steroids. Not only do we like hanging with fellow believers, talking about the Lord, we love them. AND IT SHOWS WE SERVE ONE ANOTHER, WE HELP ONE ANOTHER, WE GIVE TO ONE ANOTHER, WE PRAY FOR ONE ANOTHER. IN OTHER WORDS, WE DO ALL THE ONE ANOTHERS, NOT BECAUSE WE'RE JUST, DO IT, DO IT, JUST BE OBEDIENT, BUT BECAUSE WE LOVE THE BRETHREN. HOW DO YOU GET THAT KIND OF LOVE? IT ISN'T BECAUSE THEY'RE SO LOVEABLE. IT IS BECAUSE THEY, LIKE YOU, ARE IN CHRIST. WOW, GOD HAS SAVED US, AND WE'RE GOING TO BE SPENDING ETERNITY TOGETHER. I LOVE YOU MORE THAN PAGANS. HERE'S A TEST FOR YOU. DO YOU LOVE FELLOW BELIEVERS MORE THAN YOU LOVE UNBELIEVING FAMILY MEMBERS? TEST NUMBER NINE. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God it does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If you love to hear good teaching, you love preaching, longer the sermon the better, the deeper the better, then, then you're in Christ. If you don't like hearing from God through the proclamation of his word, that's an indicator you're not in Christ. Test number 10. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Again, I think there's a Christological element in this, but I think John is after even more. Do you blush? Do you run from speaking when you know that you should? You are like Jonah. He's told you to speak, but you keep holding it in. That is a bad sign. If the reason for it is, well, I'm kind of embarrassed about this. I recognize evangelism. It's an irksome task. It's not easy, and we need to get trained. We can practice, and we can get better at it. But... If you fear telling anybody about Jesus because, well, I don't want them to think I'm one of those Jesus crackpots, that's a sign that you are not saved. So, how did you do? I know what you're asking. What's the curve? Welcome back to a wretched surprise. Dr. Steve Lawson throwing rocks into a crowd. The one that screams is the one that got hit. What caused that screaming? First John, a 10 point test to see if you are in the truth. He preached through that book. And many people, and perhaps even you now haven't taken that 10-point test, are feeling a bit wounded. What is the correct response? People like that usually don't walk the aisle at the end of the service. I mean, Spurgeon said the wounded deer wants to withdraw to the thickets and lick its wounds in private rather than be paraded forward in front of a TV camera. Um, and so there was week after week after week after week after week after week after week, just nonstop that knock on my, my office door when the service is over. And can I talk to you? And my office became like the, the birthing room at the hospital. And I would just say, have a seat. And the, the cushion is still creased from the last person that was, you know, sat there. And the box of Kleenex right there. And, and people just under 
the, a sense of desperation. And that's the way it was in Acts 2. They, they interrupted Peter's sermon and the sinners gave the invitation. What must we do to be saved? There was a sense of desperation. Having taken the 10-point test, do you feel desperate? You're not. Desperate is to be without hope. Desperate is to recognize I'm in really big trouble here and there is no rescue for me. The good news of the gospel is you should feel desperate, but you should also know that you're not because you have a rescuer, you have a redeemer, you have a savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you have been alerted to the state of your salvation and now you're in a panic, you don't have to be. Call out to God, repent, put your trust in Jesus Christ, and you will be adopted into his family totally and forever. Let's see.